Good afternoon. This is Kathleen Causey, Chairwoman of the Board of Education of Baltimore County, and I call to order the May 19, 2020 work session of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. Baltimore County Public Schools and offices are closed to the public and non-essential personnel through June 22, 2020, in order to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff. The May 19, 2020 Board of Education meeting will be held virtually and broadcast through live stream on the BCPS website or on BCPS TV, Comcast Channel 73, and via Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. I have a motion to go into closed session as permitted by the Open Meetings Act as found in the Annotated Code of Maryland, General Provisions, Article 3-305, B1, B7, and B9 to 1, discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. Seven, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. And nine, to conduct collective bargaining negotiations or consider matters that relate to negotiations. So moved, Julie Han. Thank you, is there a second? Second, Lisa Mack. Thank you. Ms. Gover, may I have a roll call vote, please? Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Rashid? Yes. Ms. Hem? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Thank you. We have a quorum. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Kathleen Causey, Chair of the Board of Education. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, May 19th, 2020. I invite you to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. We will then have a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County and in sympathy for all of the lives that have been lost due to COVID-19. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States, States of America, of America. And, and to, to the, the republic for, for which, which it stands, it one nation, under God, a nation under God, indivisible, indivisible with, liberty with liberty and justice, and justice for, for all. For all. Thank you. Good Lord, it's me. In accordance with the mandated direction of the state superintendent, Baltimore County Public Schools and offices are currently closed to the public and non-essential personnel in order to maintain the health and safety of students and staff. In accordance with the Boards of Education resolution approved at the March 10th, 2020 board meeting, in the event of a medical or health emergency related to the COVID-19 pandemic, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members, subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member to participate fully in the meeting despite not being physically present and that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meetings that
that are open pursuant to the Opens Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, tonight's board meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through live stream on BCPS website, bcps.org, or on BCPS TV, Xfinity Channel 73, and Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct the meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making or seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. So the first item is consideration of the agenda. Dr. Williams, do you have any additions or changes? Good evening, everyone. There are no changes or additions to uh, tonight's agenda. Thank you. I have the uh, amendment to, um, I have a motion to amend the agenda to add item J2, resolution regarding extending the deadline for filing financial disclosure statements. Is there a second? Second, Julie Hen. Thank you. Board members, is there any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Rashid? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Jill? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So the motion carries and in accordance with board policy 8314, there needed to be a majority vote of the board. So we will add that agenda item tonight. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is minutes of closed session. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pur pursuant to the Opens Meetings Act for the following reasons. To one, discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. Seven, consult with counsel for legal advice. Nine, conduct collective bargaining negotiations or consider matters that relate to the negotiations. The minutes of the closed session and informational summary can be found on our website at www.bcps.org slash board slash informational dash summaries dot html. The next item on the agenda is new business personnel matters. And for that, we um, call on Ms. Lowry to present the personnel matters. Good evening, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chairwoman Hen, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. I would like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, deceased recognition of service. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits D1 through D3? So moved, Row. Do I have a second? Second, uh, second Offerman. Thank you. Board members, is there any discussion? <laughs> Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote, please? Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Rashid? Yes. Ms. Hem? Yes. Ms. Crosby? Yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Ms. Max? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you, Ms. Lowry. The next item on the agenda is item E, new business, administrative appointments, and we call on Dr. Williams. Good evening, Madam Chair and the members of the board. I would like to bring forward for your approval the following administrative appointments. 
principal of Woodlawn High School, the principal of Lions Mills Elementary School, and the principal of Campville Early Learning Center. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit E1? So move, Mac. Second and row. Thank you. Is there any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Buster? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Rashid? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The motion carries. Dr. Williams? So our first candidate is Jamel Jernigan as principal of Woodlawn High School. Currently, she's the acting principal of Woodlawn High School. Prior to this year, she served as the assistant principal of Woodlawn High School, a mathematics teacher at Woodlawn High School and Woodlawn Middle School. And she participated uh, in the Aspiring Leaders Program in 2010. She brings to us 15.8 years of service in Baltimore County. Congratulations. We clap. Our next candidate is Linda Marcinek as the principal of Lions Mill Elementary School. Prior to this appointment, she served as assistant principal at Pleasant Plains Elementary School, director of school performance in the office of the community superintendent coordinator in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction, coordinator in the Department of Research, Accountability and Assessment, and served as a special ed teacher, classroom teacher at Deep Creek Elementary School. She too participated in the Aspiring Leaders Program in 2005. She brings 26.8 years of service in Baltimore County. Congratulations. Congratulations. And our last candidate is Brenda Worksmeister, Meister, the principal of Campville Early Learning Center. Uh, currently, she is a coordinator in teaching and learning in the Office of Special Education. Prior to that, she serves as assistant principal in Middlesex Elementary School. She served as the stat teacher and mentor teacher at Hawthorne Elementary School. She serves as a resource teacher in the Office of Language Arts as well as classroom teacher and special ed teacher at Seven Oaks Elementary. She too participated as an inspiring leader in 2009. She brings 23.8 years of service to Baltimore County. Congratulations. Um, there we go. <laughs> Congratulations and thank you. The next item on the agenda is new business report on Board of Education policies. Members of the board, the policy review committee asks that the board accept this report of the committee's approved new board policies as follows. Policy 2380, records information management. Policy 5552, use of personal electronic communication devices by students. The Policy Review Committee also asks that the board accept this report of the committee's approved proposed changes to the following board policy, policy 5561, school use of reportable offenses. These recommendations are presented to you on tonight's agenda as Exhibit F. Do I have a motion to accept the recommendation of the, policy, of the board's Policy Review Committee? So moved, Hen. Thank you. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Pastor? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Rishi? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. 
Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The motion carries. The next item on the agenda is item G, public comment. Because the board is meeting virtually for today's meeting, only written public comments can be accepted. Comments may be emailed to boe at bcps.org. And these comments will be distributed to the Board of Education members and the superintendent. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. Additionally, there is public comment on policies 2380, 5552, and 5561 that were approved for first reader. And those written comments can be received at uh, written public comments can be submitted for the appropriate policy on the BCPS webpage under policies and rules. So if you go to, or you may send emails directly to boe at bcps.org. The next item on the agenda is consideration of action taken in closed session. And for that, I call on Mr. Nussbaum, but there we we did not take action. I don't think, yes, I don't believe any action was taken. Thank you. Thank you. The next item is item I, new business, the report on the EFMP CMP. And for that, we call on Mr. Dixit and Ms. Appler. Good evening and welcome. Good evening, Chair Ms. Causey, Vice Chair Ms. Han, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. My name is Pete Dixit. I'm Executive Director for Facilities Management. And today we are here to present to you our Educational Facilities Master Plan and Comprehensive Maintenance Plan. With me is Ms. Melissa Appler, who will make a brief presentation. I just want to give you a little bit of background. These are compliance documents that a state requires for our participation in capital improvement program and, and the, in accordance with their administrative guidelines. Both of these documents, they have information that the state has requested. They have provided the format. And most of the information has already been shared with the board in one form or the other. So tonight, after Ms. Appler's presentation, we are going to request your approval. And uh, uh, so now I ask Ms. Appler to give you a brief presentation. Melissa. Good evening. Um, next slide, so, Tracy. Um, as uh, Mr. Dixit already mentioned, each year the state of Maryland's public school construction program requires that BCPS uh, submit an educational facilities master plan by July 1 and a comprehensive maintenance plan by October 15th to the state. The update of these documents is coordinated by the Office of Strategic Planning and Facilities Management. Uh, content in these documents is outlined in the rules, regulations, and procedures documents of the state's public school construction program. Next slide. The EFMP serves as a guide for state and local personnel when evaluating the capital improvement program. It must be submitted to the state in order to submit a capital plan. It ensures the capital improvement program uh, projects address enrollment needs, projections, systemic maintenance, and support education programs. The CMP uh, supports the delivery of education programs in safe, healthy, physical environments. This plan ensures that a positive learning environments are maintained. It eliminates or reduces the number and scope of safety ha hazards on a property. It provides buildings that function at top efficiency and ensures continuous use of facilities without dis 
into education program. Next slide. Um, these tables show the required elements that are outlined in the public by the public school construction program. A significant amount of this information is already published in Baltimore County Public Schools and county documents, such as the board policies and rules, enrollment and projection information that's already provided in students count, a county master plan, and the adequate public facility zones. The Baltimore County Department of Planning actually completes the entire community analysis section and adequate public facility ordinance analysis. The required elements of the CMP includes the administration goals, the personal organization, uh, scheduled and unscheduled deferred maintenance, energy conservation, and strategic initiatives. Next slide. Um, and if anyone has any questions about these documents, uh, we open up to you. Board members, we'll go around the dais in order to hear comments or questions from each board member. Mr. Kuhn? No comment. Ms. Pasteur? No comment. Mr. Offerman? No, uh, none. Mr. Rashid? Mr. Rashid, we will move along to Ms. Hen. Ms. Jones. Thank you, Ms. Dixon and Ms. Apple. I do have a question. How do you prioritize your facilities ratings? And is there a facilities ratings that you guys have in coming together with the CIP and the EFMP? Um, it's a good question. Uh, we do not have facilities rating. If you, if you, if your question is about the ranking of the facilities, we do not have that. As you know, we are in the midst of developing a multi-year improvement plan and after completion of that plan and some of you will be part of different focus groups we have for that plan we hope to get a ranking of all the facilities in the meantime we have just the general condition good fair and that should be part of this plan So how do you prioritize these projects? Is it based on just the ratings, the conditions of the facilities? Is it also based on community feedback, public outreach? Um, because my concern is how do some facilities get priorities over some of the other facilities that I have seen around the entire school system? Yeah, each year we get feedback uh, from strategic planning, from board meetings, and we have some general idea about the condition of the building. So we develop a theme for our capital improvement program. In the past, in the recent past, it has to do with the enrollment projections, air conditioning of school, and infrastructure improvement. So most of the schools that are included in the plan that board approved has to do with the need for the capacity because we didn't have enough schools. So you will see that in Northeast and in Northwest, we have built new schools, and that is just to meet the enrollment needs. Also in plans are those schools that were not air conditioned. And that was a theme that was developed with extensive conversation with the community and with the board. So that pretty much used up most of our available capital dollars. In addition to that, we had some what we call systemic improvements, which are roofs and boilers and old chillers. So that's what you have. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Mr. Dixit. Um, our, this comment is really from Ms. Makita Scott. This is why your equity committee is so important that you undergird 
these facilities, these ratings as well, that we look at the equity lens in our facilities for all of our students around the entire district, um, for all of our children and not just the districts that get a lot more public feedback. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. McMillian? Yes, I have a related question for Mr. Pete. If schools were to open in September, October, Mr. Pete, are Colgate Elementary and Berkshire Elementary scheduled to, to open on time? Again, it's a very good question. Um, right now, we are around the same point where we were with the previous year's projects. But this year, as you know, the conditions are different. Um, in the past years, uh, we were a little behind and we caught up in the summertime and we hope to do that again. But it is so much uncertain that every day um, situation changes. So we are in conversation with the superintendent and should there be any change, superintendent will share all of the information with the board. Uh, and the reason we cannot give you a definite information at this time, because who's going to get sick and how many people are going to get sick, we don't know. What's going to be the impact of COVID-19 on our supply chain? We don't know at, that, at this point. So we are monitoring the situation closely and, and, and Dr. Williams um, will keep you posted should there be any change. Thank you. Ms. Mack? No, thank you. Ms. Rose? Yes, I have questions. Well, you skipped over me, Ms. Scott. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. <laughs> Scott. <laughs> thank you. Um, just a, a quick question, um, and I appreciate everyone's questions. Um, I know we've spoken a lot about water quality. Does that factor into this anywhere, or is that something separate? We have been providing bottled water to all schools, so it really does not is not part of this conversation. So I guess it's not part of this conversation because we're not providing bottled water. So I guess I'm wondering as far as then the facilities that are the the faucets that provide the water is that a part of this or or would that be a, another conversation well there there are two pieces to that that response number 1 when the schools are renovated when the schools are replaced or built we do not have a water quality issue also we are in the midst of testing program as you know and at the end of testing program all of the fixtures have to meet the state standard. But during all of this time, whether it is good quality, bad quality, or fair quality, we are providing bottled water to every student. So there's total safety right now. And in future, when we build a school or we, or we if we do not meet the state requirement, we will replace the fixtures. Thank you. And now, Ms. Rowe. Hello. Uh, Mr. Dixit, I have a few questions. So I heard you say briefly that the County Department of Planning gives the numbers for um, projections for developments and expected enrollment based on new developments. Is there any input that the school system has as far as that formula? Because we've seen at different times that we have these developments approved by the county. And my understanding is that it is the developer themselves who estimates how many school children will come out of that development. And then the development gets built. And lo and behold, there's triple or quadruple the number of children coming out of the development and overcrowding the schools. But these developments are often used to justify new schools based on projected enrollment. So I would like to know to what degree the school system has input into uh, creating the numbers for the developers that ultimately go to the county. 
as to the projections of school children likely to come out of these developments? Um, I'll give you the part that I know, and then maybe Ms. Appler can help me later on. Office of Strategic Planning of School System works closely uh, with the Baltimore County Department of Planning. Uh, we have regular meetings. Our processes are checked and cross-checked, and our methods have to be approved by the state and by the county. And in the past, county working with us, we have worked with independent consultant to check on our processes and our projections for the entire system have more than 99% accuracy. <clears throat> but projections are still our projections. And as you know, that certain schools, uh, uh, the actual numbers may be slightly different than projections. So, but, but it is not that projections are way off. So I don't know if I answered your question, but we work closely with the county's Department of Planning. We use approved projection methodology. We have to certify our methodology to state as part of this EFMP, they will get a letter. And we are in the past double checking it by the help of independent uh, planning companies. With that, uh, Ms. Appler, if I have missed anything or if you want to add, please feel free to do so. Um, I would say that um, the yield factors, the pupil yield factors that are used to generate um, the developments are um, updated about every five years. And that report is available on the BCPS website of the factors that are used when new developments are um, in consideration by the county planning. Okay, so when a development is under consideration for approval and the developer is required to do a study of pupil yield, my understanding is do they get feedback from the school system as far as pupil yield or do they just come up with a number and then we have to work around that? The pupil yield factors are actually developed by Baltimore County Public Schools uh, for the county regulations. Um, and then we work closely in the development of those yields. And their yields are updated about every five years based on past developments that have happened in each election district. So those yield factors are provided by the school system to Baltimore County Planning to use. And we periodically review those to make sure they're accurate and reflective of what's happened in areas. Okay, thank you. Can I make a comment? Yes, Mr. McMillian. I saw a form that was submitted by a developer in regards to Spares Point Country Club Estates. And that form showed zero students coming out of that development to those surrounding schools. And initially, the, the initial form I saw, uh, there were blanks on that form. They didn't, the developers didn't fill it in. And planning went back to the developers and highlighted the, the information that was not presented, the blanks. And then the, the developer went through and filled those in, and there were zeros in there. And so at some place, you know, these documents were sent to me from somebody that had secured them from the Department of Planning. So at some point in time, this information, there was a, a, there was a gap in the communication between us and the developers or us and planning, or I was flabbergasted to see these zeros. And I don't think that somebody fabricated that. I think that that was a real document that was forwarded me. So I think that that process needs to be re-examined on our input that we give planning, and then planning turns around and gives it to developers. Thank you very much. Mr. McMillian, this is Lisa Mack. Can you refresh my memory? How many houses are, were on that plan? Do you remember? I haven't, I haven't touched that 
that development in a while, if I'm not mistaken, it was 306 that had grown from, you know, 100 and something, and then went up to 200 and something with a pud, and then it went up to 306. And when it got but to I, 306, it still showed zero student yield? On the document that I showed that was highlighted, there was zero students. And that's what made it so astounding. There had to be, and it wasn't a senior complex, you know, 55 and over. So it was, that's what made it just unbelievable on my part. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. McMillian, if I may address your concern. I, I'm sorry, Mr. Dixon, I don't mean to cut you off. This is Molly. Uh, there really is a loop that needs to be closed between planning at the county level and the school board. Having worked for a developer 20 years ago, what I do know is when we submit plans for new developments to any county council, whether it's Anne Arundel or Baltimore, they really are looking for infrastructure numbers. They're looking for how many people are gonna move in for roads, for water, for sewage, for storm water. Um, the children factor is not really considered by the planning department, and that's really something this board should initiate so we are also in the loop when uh, houses are being built so schools don't get overcrowded. And um, I don't know if it's a deliberate thing, but the school board is definitely left out of the planning uh, portion of development. And I've seen that for a fact. And, and I would like to add this. Something else I thought was extremely interesting is I went to the boundary software, our boundary software, and I punched in the address to the Country Club of States. And that address, it came back and it said that those children would go to Patapsco High School, General John Stricker, and Grant, not, well, uh, Edgemere Elementary School. So I told my constituents that. Then a couple of weeks later, about 10 days later, I said, I need to check myself. I just want to double check. So I punched it in. It came out the same information. I don't know where that is coming from. So we, we can share your concern uh, with, the, with the Department of Planning in Baltimore County. Ms. Kazi, can I have the floor? I'd like to finish what I was getting at. So, so what Mr. happened? Mr. McMillian, continue, and then Ms. Rowe, you're next. So, what happened was there was a number down the bottom of the software. It said if you're not, if you want more information on this boundary or on on, the, on this information where you punched in the address, to contact that office. So, I contacted the office and I said, you know, I want to make sure that I'm accurate in this information that I'm sharing with the constituents. That was on a Thursday at 4 o'clock. On Tuesday, I got a response back that said, Ms. McMillian, there's a discrepancy in, in the software. These children are not going to go to Patapsco. They're going to go to Sparrows Point High School. And uh, I, then so I, I went back to my constituents and said, hey, wait a minute. They're not going to go to Patapsco. They're going to go to Sparrows Point. I alerted the local politicians and they said, oh, we knew that all, all along. We, we knew those kids were going to Spares Point. So one in particular, and I'm not going to mention his name. So then I came and, and I said, so how can our software be behind? It was two years. The, the email from the county councilman was 2017 where it said, oh, we knew that. We knew they were going to Spares Point. And then this was 2019. So how come how how can that be that our software was two years behind what the what the county councilman knew? So I'm finished. Thank you very much, Mr. Dixit. Do you have a uh, response to Mr. <clears throat> McMillian's concern about the software lagging? No, I do not. Uh, I do not have that specific response to the question or software. Mm -hmm. But we can definitely bring it to the attention of uh, county's Department of Planning in our next meeting. Okay, and if you could please follow up on the uh, checking on the software and if there is a delay. And um, uh, Dr. Williams, if you could have Mr. Dixit uh, put that in a, a weekly update to the full board. So, so Madam, 
Madam Chair, I, I would like to follow up with the team and we'll be happy to provide some additional information once I follow up. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. McMillian, for bringing this to our attention. Um, but as Mr. Dixon said, um, we need first need to have a conversation internally and then we'll bring it up to the County Planning Committee um, and we'll provide an update um, with what we have found. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Williams. Williams. I'll, I'll forward the email to you that where it said that there was a discrepancy. Thank you. And Ms. Rowe, did you have a comment? Yes. So the, I actually do know the answer to Mr. McMillian's question about the map. It has to do with when you type in an address in our software on the website, that software to type in an address, in some cases, can have discrepancies against the map. Okay, so Mr. Dixit and I was uh, muted. Okay, so Mr. Dixit heard your response and then he can evaluate that with um, what Dr. Williams just said they would do for the board. Okay, and um, Makita, I already, Ms. Scott, did you already make your comment? I believe I did, but yeah, I don't have any further comments. Okay, thank you. And then we have our um, new board member, Dr. Aaron Hager. Did you have comments or questions for Mr. Dixit or Ms. Appler? I do not have any comments. Okay, thank you. Mr. Dixit, I just had a question since you had brought it up. Um, the board is working, uh, uh, has approved last year to work on a multi-year plan, a 10-year capital plan, and the county executive funded it through the county. And so they um, did an RFP and, uh, and started that process. Given what's happened with the pandemic, can you tell us where the planning stages are now? <clears throat> we are still proceeding uh, with the development of plan. We had a uh, few meetings with the consultant and some focus groups. We have also identified members of the community, members from the curriculum instruction, and members of the board from different for different focus groups. And we are having virtual meeting, which is being conducted by the consultant that has been selected. And some of you will be part of it very soon. And our target date for completion remains the same, which is the first phase for high schools. We are targeting it for September, October of this year, fall of this year, early fall. And for the entire plan, to be completed by the fall, early fall next year. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that presentation. And um, thank you for continuing to work in these uh, difficult times. And if you do not have any more questions, we are requesting your approval tonight. Do I have a motion to approve the Educational Facilities Master Plan and the Fiscal Year 2021 Comprehensive Maintenance Plan. Ms. Pastor, so moved. Is there a second? Ms. Joe's second. Board members, any additional discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Gover, can you do a roll call vote? Um, Ms. Kazi, I believe this is coming to uh, the June 9th contract committee um, for a vote. This is just a report tonight. So I don't believe it needs a vote. Okay, Mr. Dixit. Well, we'd like to get your approval tonight because we have answered all the questions. So uh, okay, if we, that's the board desire to do that, we can do that. Yes, I think we should do that. So Ms. Gover, you said it was originally scheduled for uh, to go in front of the Buildings and Contracts Committee? 
it's a contract, so yes. Yeah. It was going for approval on June 9th. Okay. So we can approve it tonight since there's no more questions. I think so it's I'll possible just... I may have further questions after reading through it thoroughly. And um, if, if we don't approve it tonight and it goes to building and contracts, it does allow board members to further examine the rather large document and make sure that they don't have questions. Um, I'd prefer to let it go to buildings and contracts. Um, this is Ms. Hen. Likewise, I would prefer the time to review it and discuss it in building and contracts. So, Mr. This Dixon, is, uh, given that, Mr. Ms. Dixon, Crosby, this is this is Dr. Scriven. Uh, good evening to all. We have no problem with that. We have no problem with that delay. So, uh, I'm a part of building contracts as well, and uh, it can go June 9th. Thank you, Dr. Scrivens. Um, since it was not on the agenda as a voting item, then we will um, defer it to its original schedule, as Ms. Gover indicated, going to buildings and contracts on June 9th and then to the full board. Thank you. So thank you both for the presentation. Thank you. Point of yes. order, Ms. Causey. There is a motion on the floor. It has to be withdrawn. Thank you, Ms. Joes. So who seconded and who moved the motion would have to I move moved the motion. I made the motion. Um, I'm glad to withdraw the motion. Thank you. And the second? Withdrawn. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Joes. Thank you, Ms. Appler. Thank you, Mr. Dixit, for your time tonight. So the next item on the agenda is item K, new business report on emergency boundary. And for that, actually, we're going to welcome back Mr. Dixit, Ms. Appler, and also Ms. Christina Byers. Ms. Causey. The next yes. item would be the item J, consideration of changes in policy. Thank you. Oh, that's in the small print in the middle. Okay, item J, consideration of changes in policy. Um, deferred from our May 5th, 2020 board meeting is a resolution in consideration of changes of, consideration of changes in policy. It was um, a resolution that was developed by um, our board council and it was presented to board members at the previous meeting um, and and board members had asked questions and made um, revisions and and then the draft was presented so the board members had received that previously and dr hager i believe you were emailed the document so um is there a motion to accept consideration of changes in policy? So moved. Is that Ms. Mack? Lisa, sorry. Is there a second? Second. Ms. Hen, thank you. Ms. Mack, would you like to um, speak to your motion? Um, no, I think it's pretty cut and dry that, um, you know, the superintendent will work with the board on any upcoming changes that happen because of COVID and will notify the board um, of changes that he has to take um, in an emergency situation. Um, but I think the resolution is pretty clear. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Board members, are there questions or comments? Hi, Ms. Causey. <clears throat> this is Mr. Kuhn. Um, I actually don't see the resolution attached to board docs, and I'm curious, are we supposed to go to the previous meeting to actually see the document? I mean, I could probably find it in my email, but this is supposed to be public, correct? Mr. Kuhn, it wasn't um, put into board docs last meeting or this meeting because it was still in draft form. 
um, you were to make additional changes or approve the changes that were made uh, that went back and forth with the board. So it wasn't, it was an email. If you'd I like, I can read like. the resolution into the record. Um, excuse me, this is Ms. Scott. Is this the resolution that was sent over to us, I believe, this, e this evening, or just a few hours ago? Yesterday. No, it, w it, it was emailed today, but it was previously emailed from um, in advance of the May 5th meeting. So there were no changes from the version that we received for the May 5th meeting and the version that was emailed, I believe it was at 2.53 today? That's correct. So it's the same document. Okay, so then I guess Mr. Kuhn would then reference that same document that we were previously emailed. Yes. Ms. Scott, the, the resolution that was emailed to you today is for J2. Yeah, I th I, this is Andy Nussbaum. I think you're talking about two different resolutions. So I want to make sure everybody's on the same page. The first resolution, which is J1, is the resolution that gives the superintendent authority to modify your policies. J2 is the resolution that deals with extensions for the filing of financial disclosure statements. Okay, yes. No, I'm talking about the one that, um, yes, not the, the financial disclosure one. They were both emailed, and I see the, uh, the, the two different ones. They were both emailed at the same time. Okay, yes. thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you. It's yeah. short. No, no, I appreciate the clarification. It's short, and so for clarity, I'll be happy to read it into the record. Whereas Lawrence J. Hogan, Jr., governor of the state of Maryland, issued a declaration of state emergency and existence of catastrophic health emergency, COVID-19, on March 5, 2020, regarding the outbreak of disease caused by the novel coronavirus and several executive orders thereafter, which remain in effect. And whereas all public schools in Maryland have been ordered closed through, the, this says at least May 15, 2020, um, and whereas the Board of Education of Baltimore County is aware of several board policies that cannot be complied with or fully implemented as written in light of the current state of emergency and school closure order, and whereas the board believes it would be impracticable for it to review and revise on a temporary basis each board policy that may be affected, and whereas the board has determined that given the current situation, the superintendent should have flexibility in implementing board policies. Be it therefore resolved that in the event the superintendent determines that due to current circumstances, any board policy cannot be fully implemented or that full compliance is not possible or practicable, the board hereby authorizes the superintendent to implement such policy to the fullest extent reasonable and practicable and to waive any policy requirement that cannot be met due to current circumstances on a temporary basis without prior approval by the board, as long as such action is consistent with federal and state law and regulations, guidance from the state superintendent of schools, and mandates from the Maryland State Board of Education in effect at that time. And it is further resolved that the superintendent shall report to the board in writing as soon as practicable with rationale for any board policy that he has determined cannot be fully implemented or any policy requirements that cannot be fully met which the board shall then re discuss at the next board meeting. And it is further resolved that any effective policy will be fully complied with and implemented at such time as the current crisis is over and schools are ordered reopened. So do board members have any questions or comments? Ms. Ms. Causey, this is Andy Nussbaum, if I may. Yes. The, the, um, when I sent that out, um, in, in terms of legal advice, my recommendation was that that language that talks about shall discuss at the next board meeting instead read, which the board may then discuss uh, at a scheduled board meeting to give a little more flexibility so that it's not required that necessarily every time there's a, a modification that it must be discussed at the next board meeting. So I wanted to, to I mean, I know that, that this has been gone through several drafts. My recommendation to give the board additional flexibility is that the last uh, or the next to last be it resolved reads that the superintendent shall report to the board in writing as soon as practicable with rationale any board policy that he has determined cannot be fully implemented 
or any policy requirements that cannot be fully met, which the board may then discuss at a scheduled board meeting. So I don't know how you want to handle which which version you'd like to have the board consider. Okay, well, I'll continue to accept uh, comments and questions from board members, and um, then board members can chime in. Thank you, Ms. Causey. Uh, thank you, Andy. This is Molly. I was going to ask you because you're at the last board meeting, you had recommended um, that the language be changed to shawl, and I agree with that. So I would like to amend that the last sentence be reverted back to what Andy had in his original um, motion, where it says what was the board sh may then discuss at the next board meeting. Okay, there's a motion to amend this resolution. Is there a second? I'll second. second. Offerman. I'm sorry, who was that? Offerman. It was uh, Makita Scott and Offerman. Okay, thank you. I had a question for um, Dr. Williams in terms of this motion to amend. Dr. Williams, do you see that it's a... Um, that it would be necessary to amend, or would it be reasonable and um, in order to have it shall rather than may? I can support um, either one. I think it's, again, it's, am I on? Yes, I can support either one. And I think there was a lengthy discussion at the last board meeting related to this. Ms. Causey. Are there other questions or comments related to the amendment? Ms. Scober, can we have a roll call vote? All in favor of the amendment? Mr. Kuhn? No. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Rashid? Yes. Ms. Hen? No. Ms. Causey? Uh, no. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? No. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? No. Dr. Hager? No. Six. Um, the motion fails. The motion fails. Board members, are there other questions or comments? Ms. Causey, I just yes. have a comment. This is Russ Kuhn. Um, I would suggest with the board's ability to virtually meet and the ability to make that happen in a relatively short amount of time that we do not have a need for this um, resolution at all. So I will be voting no going forward. Thank you. Ms. Causey, this is Ms. Mack. Yes. Um, I had a conversation today with someone from um, another board. I had a very lengthy conversation, as a matter of fact, and just um, in preparation for this meeting was asking, how, how did you handle the changes that you had to make? And I guess similar to what Mr. Kuhn, Kuhn just said, um, when the need arose, the superintendent called a meeting, said this is what is happening um this is what i think we i've worked, met with my staff this is what we need to do for continue um con, yeah learning for you know um the safety of our students and staff and they handled it right then and there and as different issues came up they continued to meet and when i look at the issue of covid obviously it caught us by surprise not us the school system but us the state of maryland the united states but 
on a going forward basis, I, I don't know that we are going to need that element of surprise any longer because we're all watching this very carefully. And if there do does need to be changes, I think that we as a board can get together, discuss them, say yay or nay, and move forward. Ms. Causey? Yes. So I guess my concern with not having some type of resolution is that we have a lot of policies. And a lot of our policies to be in legal compliance you have to be in the school building. And so my concern is that if we don't have some kind of resolution that allows the superintendent to be out of compliance um, and then notify the board of which policies and why, then we're going to be meeting, uh, what, 50, 60, 70, 80, 100 times for every single policy that it's not possible for the school system to be in legal compliance with, and there's a lot. So I do think that we need some kind of a resolution, but I'd like to suggest that if people are unsatisfied with the language of the resolution, that it would be possible to put the resolution into PRC and get information about um, exactly how many policies are impacted. Uh, we could even ask staff to list the anticipated policies that we would that the superintendent would essentially need a waiver from the board on because i don't actually want to meet for every single minutia of every policy that we're out of compliance with because covid 19 because the policies are good policies in a normal school situation and we have our normal policy review committee and that works very well and we could really get bogged down in the weeds with reviewing every policy exception that's only necessary because we're not in a school building right now. Ms. Causey, this is Ms. Joes, which is why board council, when Mr. Nussbaum made the suggestion, it was to make sure we don't have that many meetings. The shawl to May was a big change in that, but unfortunately was voted down. I was following what Dr. Mr. Nussbaum was suggesting. This would make sure the resolution went through that would allow the superintendent to amend those policies and we would not have to meet for every single policy that would be amended but we could meet when we had a chance at a regularly scheduled meeting and he could bring all of those policies together that was the language that mr nussbaum was trying to uh, reiterate in terms of legal terms um, that would have stopped it mr Causey, i'd like to say mr. something hmm. mr mcmillian Doc, I view Dr. Williams as the educational expert in this Baltimore County Public School System. I trust his judgment when it comes to these policies. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Causey, this is Ms. Pasteur. I think we need the resolution, but uh, as Mr. McMillian just said, I also trust Dr. Williams in the event that Dr. Williams feels that there needs to be some discussion. I don't see this as an instruction to that. So if we have the resolution, then he may go forth, use his judgment, do what he has to do. But if he feels that he would like to bring it to the board prior to doing that, then he can do that. But I really um, agree with whomever said it earlier. Um, I, I just don't want to have to have a meeting, um, whether I'm sitting here or not. I don't want to be called to a meeting every time he needs to make So I think have the resolution, it can be balanced and tempered by his wisdom and his discretion, call a meeting or not. Madam Thank Chair, you. Madam Chair, this is uh, Daryl Williams. I just want to uh, reiterate a, a, a part of the resolution. It does state consistent with federal and state law with the state superintendent and MSDE. Clearly, I am not going to uh, decide to change a policy just because I want to change a policy people will be in alignment uh, with what the state board is saying with what the state superintendent may recommend or suggest or mandate um, and so 
um, I just want to just remind the full board about context of this resolution. Thank you for that, Dr. Williams. And just to dovetail with that, a lot of the reason for needing this is the waivers and additional guidelines and mandates that we have received at the state level um, in terms of waiving our end of year assessments um, and st similar things um, that the board would normally expect to be implemented. So um, yes, there are obviously a lot of uh, guidance and regulations that we will continue um, to have you uh, implement for the school to follow those. So thank you for sharing that. Other board members? Uh, this is Erin Hager. Um, was this resolution developed in a what if scenario or is there a specific circumstance that is, has come up that has required the, the development of this resolution? So it is generally, but also uh, something that came up specifically was the calendar. Um, in April, it was very early April when Dr. Salmon said that schools that had been closed for two weeks were going to be extended closed for three more weeks and that she wanted continuity of learning to take place on April 6th. While April 6th was the originally the beginning of our spring break. So Dr. Williams had, I believe it was 48 hours notice uh, from the time of um, guidelines coming out from the state superintendent in order to make a decision that we had to inform our staff that we were not going to have spring break on those days, um, that there was an adjustment that was needed. And there really was very little time. So. Um, that was one of the specifics, but some of the general ones are the waivers of our end of the year assessments. And I'm sure Dr. Williams could rattle off uh, a number of other ones. Thank you. This is Mr. Offerman. I'd like to move the question, please. Is there a, a second to moving the question? Second. Second. Uh, Second. Is there any discussion on moving the question? Can we have a roll call vote? Mr. Kim? No. Ms. Pester? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Rashid? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Jost? No. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? No. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Thank you. So the motion carries to move the vote, which means we will now vote on the resolution uh, without additional discussion. So can we have a roll call vote in um, accepting the resolution as it was read into the record? Ms. Causey, I'm sorry. Uh, did, uh, Dr. Williams did say he did not care which way the resolution was written with the may and the uh, child is that correct yes dr so williams said he could uh he could operate with either version all right thank you miss gover if you could continue with the roll call vote mr kim no. Ms. Pester? Sure. Ms. Pester? Sorry, I thought it was off. I'm sorry. Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. 
Mr. Rashid? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Clausey? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Thank you. Ms. Cooper, can you give me the final tally? 11-1. Thank you. The motion carries. The next item on the agenda is item J2 that we um, added at the beginning of the meeting. And I will read that resolution into the record. This is a resolution regarding extending the deadline for filing financial disclosure statements, whereas the Board of Education Policy 8364, Section 3B, requires that financial disclosure statements be filed by individuals appointed to fill a vacancy in an office for which a financial disclosure statement is required and who has not already filed same for the preceding calendar year within 30 days after appointment. And whereas the Baltimore County public school system has been ordered closed by the state superintendent of schools since March 16, 2020, and remain closed for the remainder of the school year. And whereas the board previously extended the deadline for the filing of financial disclosure statements by employees, and whereas it would be reasonable and appropriate to extend the deadline for the filing of financial disclosure statements by new hires and new appointees. Therefore, be it resolved this 19th day of May 2020 that the deadline for filing financial disclosure statements by new hires and appointees pursuant to policy 8364 be extended for a period of 60 days past the due date when the school system reopens after the current emergency closure. Is there a motion to accept that resolution? So moved. Roe. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Offerman. Thank you. Board members, is there any discussion? If you could just state your name and make your comment or question. Hearing none, Ms. Gover, can you take a roll call vote, please? Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Pester? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Rashid? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McGillian? Add some glitter yes. to the slime. Yes. Huh? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. Now, the next item on the agenda is item K, new business, report on emergency boundary. And for that, we will call back Mr. Dixit and Ms. Appler and also ask Ms. Byers to join us. Thank you. Okay, so good evening, Chair Coffey, Vice Chair Kent, Dr. Williams, this evening to bring forward for your consideration a boundary recommendation for the village at Gunpowder Falls development. Currently, the homes that are being built in the village of Gunpowder Falls are within the catchment area for two elementary schools, Pine Grove Elementary and Seven Oaks Elementary, and two middle schools, Pine Grove Middle School and Perry Hall Middle School. The boundary study was designed to align these homes to a singular elementary and a singular middle school. Here to share information with you on this development, the boundary process, and the recommendation are Mr. Dixit and Ms. Appler. And with that, I am going to turn things over to Mr. Dixit, and he is going to give you some background on the new development of the village of Gunpowder Falls. Thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Dixit. Thank you, Ms. Byer. Um, I think you have already introduced the topic. I'll just give a little bit of background for those of you 
who are familiar with that area, this particular development is being built where the old Bateman eatery was on the crossing of Harford Road and Cub Hill Road. Right there, we have a development of 28 townhomes. And part of those homes are the northern section is in the, in the boundary of Pine Grove and Perry Hall, and the southern section is in the boundary of Seven Oaks and Pine Grove. The high school is not impacted. It remains Perry Hall Middle School, Perry Hall High School. Now, just to give you some idea about the potential yield that we are talking about, is about total of 20 students, 11 elementary school student and four middle school plus five high school. With that, I'll ask Ms. Appler to share with you the rest of the presentation, and then we'll come back in the next board meeting for your approval of the boundary emergency boundary adjustment. With that, Ms. Appler. Good evening. Uh, can I, next slide. Um, as Mr. Dixit said, uh, this total development includes 28 townhome units. Uh, as of March 2020, no units were currently occupied. However, uh, we do know that several units have been sold, uh, but it's not clear when uh, occupancy is anticipated on these units. Uh, if a student were to register to Tomorrow, the zone school will be determined by their actual um, address of the unit. Based on the 2017 pupil yield study, 28 single family attached homes, um, like Mr. Dixit said, would yield about 11 elementary school students, four middle, and five high school students. Um, slide, please. As you all know, um, uh, the COVID 19 pandemic has had a profound impact on the school system's academic and administrative operations. To assure a timely resolution of this matter um, and to avoid disruption and confusion related to a split community, a condensed boundary change process has been initiated for the village at Gunpowder Falls development. Baltimore County Public Schools Rule 1280, uh, Section 9, Emergencies, indicates that each step in the boundary change process may be condensed or changed when implementation of the boundary change is required to do emergency circumstances. In consultation with BCPS's Office of Law, it was determined that COVID-19 pandemic qualifies as an emergency circumstance. Next slide, please. Uh, the condensed process includes the following steps. Uh, board recommendation, uh, which is consistent with Section 9 of 1280, uh, to be as transparent as possible, uh, given the public health concerns, in lieu of a uh, board public hearing, comments uh, may be submitted to the board via email, an online comment form that we created, or regular mail uh, by May 29th. Following the public comment period, the board will take final action at the June 9th meeting of the board. Next slide, please. This table provides an overview of the difference between the full boundary and a condensed boundary study process that, um, that we're is using. The primary differences are the full boundary study process, a boundary study committee is formed. This committee evaluates options session and conducts a survey. These steps result in a recommendation that the community superintendent brings to the board. <clears throat> While the condensed process does include an evaluation of Rule 1280 considerations, it does not include the Boundary Study Committee, Public Information Session, or survey. Both processes include a recommendation to the board and opportunities for public to provide comments to the board. However, in the condensed process, due to public health concerns, the public hearing um, a comment period will be uh, provided in lieu of that. Uh, following that, as consistent across the board, is the board uh, decisions. Next slide, please. In developing a recommendation, staff considered several factors. Can the recommendation provide a solution before families are affected and move in? Does the recommendation minimize transportation confusion for students? 
does the recommendation provide trans efficient transportation routes? And does the recommendation utilize school capacity? After a careful consideration of these factors, the recommendation is to align the boundary to Seven Oaks Elementary School and Pine Grove Middle School, seen in the this map here. Next slide, please. This table shows the capacity, enrollment, and utilization as of September 30th, 2019 for the recommended boundary, including the potential development impacts. The recommended boundary school, schools are shown in red highlight. As you can see, the current utilization for the recommended elementary and middle schools are lower. Seven Oaks currently has a utilization of about 103%, while Pine Grove Elementary is overcrowded at 120.5%. You can also see that the 11 students anticipated from the development would increase the utilization minimally at Seven Oaks to about 105%. When we look at the 10 year enrollment projections for these schools, which can be found in the recommendation report that you received this evening, uh, this shows that over the next 10 years, enrollment at Seven Oaks Elementary is stable while Pine Grove Elementary is anticipated to increase. At the middle school level, the recommendation is to align the boundary to attend Pine Grove Middle School. This school is currently under capacity while Perry Hall Middle is over capacity. Next slide, please. Consistent uh, with BCPS track record for providing accessible and transparent process, a website providing information on the development is accessible from the main BCPS webpage under the focus on facilities boundary. Several methods for collecting community feedback are available, uh, email, a community comment form, uh, and uh, regular um, postal mail. All comments received will be included as part of the formal transcript on the board's website. Next slide, please. Uh, so next steps, uh, the public comment period will open and uh, we'll receive comments through midnight of May 29th, and then a board decision will be made on June 9th. Next slide and then if there are any questions. Board members, if you would just state your name and then you can have questions and comments. Lily Rowe. I find the comment period to be incredibly short and I'm not sure that we can communicate this boundary study to the public and expect comments just within the next few days. And I would like to know what the impact of extending the comment period so that there's at least a full two weeks to communicate this to the public and get public feedback. Ms. Happer? Um, currently, we the May 29th date was a picked in consistency with uh, board policy 1280, and that typically um, the board hearing is held 10 days prior to a board decision. So, in consistency, keep consistency with that. That date was selected. So, what would be the impact of pushing the board decision ahead a meeting or two? As um, another part of policy in Rule 1280 is that uh, for a boundary study to take implementation for the prior year, it should be a decision should be made prior to the end of the school year. So, I really feel that because we're only just now finding out about this, and the public is probably only just now finding out about this, and usually our boundary study processes take three, four months that it, it is not fair to give people only a few days of public comment for something they're just finding out about now. This um, is a condensed uh, process per policy in Rule 1280, and the steps can be modified um, if you feel a uh, extended period is needed for comment.
And we can take that, that recommendation to Dr. Williams and um, let you know um, regarding the uh, recommendation to have an extended comment period. Okay. Thank, you for, thank you for that, Ms. Byers. Um, what I would suggest is that board members continue with their questions and comments. And um, then if there's any motions to consider or um, if we want to make adjustments, we can consider that. Board member, are there other questions or comments? Ms. Causey, yes, this is, this is Ms. Jose. Um, my question is, why is this an emergency boundary study? Um, typically, like we said, we usually have a longer period where we're informed of the boundary study. So was what made this an emergency boundary study is my question. Let me try to answer that and maybe then uh, Ms. Apro can expand on that. What we are trying to achieve here is maintain the integrity of that community. So right now we know that there's only a few units that are sold. Uh, as the time moves along, there'll be more and more units that will be sold. So there will be, if we don't take any action this year, students will already be starting to go into different schools and we we'll lose that unity of the community that we are trying to achieve and we are going to lose that transportation minimizing that confusion and the efficiency that we gain by providing transportation for one set of schools and not two or three or four different sets of schools so so uh, thank you mr Dixon. this again is what the loop that I'm saying is the board is not notified of developments uh, happening. So regularly these schools would go to Perry Hall Middle, which is very overcrowded. So what you're trying to do is to mitigate that from happening? Well, we are um, trying to achieve several to, different objectives. One of them is utilizing the capacity to the maximum level. Perry Hall Middle School, as you know, is already over capacity, but that's not the main motivation. The main motivation is to maintain the integrity of the community and avoid any transportation confusion. So, Ms. Jones, currently the way the development is situated, it's, it's straddling the catchment areas of two elementary schools and two middle schools. And so, rather than have students living in one community, be divided, we want to align the community to one boundary for the elementary schools and one boundary for middle school. Thank you, Dr. Byers. This is Rod McMillian. I'd like to, I have a question. Go ahead, Mr. McMillian. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. This is Ms. Causey. If I had questions around um, the timing of this development in terms of um, are all of the buildings built? Are any of the buildings built? How many are there real students in the count or is it projected students as we've discussed a little bit earlier this evening? As, as Ms. Appler indicated, there are to our knowledge, there are four townhomes that have been built. And this number that we have is the potential or projected yield. This is not coming, this is not a definite number, but this is what we do and we don't know how many and when they'll be sold. A total of 28, four of them completed. We don't know when the remaining 24 will be completed and sold. but. It is in our interest, in our mind, is to have this thing settled before the occupants come in there so that they know which schools they are going to go in. It'll be a lot more difficult if we start doing this after the residents move in. 
Ms. Appler, do you want to add something? Did I miss anything? No, you've covered it. Okay. Mr. Dixit, this is Lisa Mack. Could you answer Mr. McMillian's question, and then I have a question of my own. Can you repeat that question? It's about how long we have known. To my knowledge, we have only known about it in last few months. It's not that we knew about it 18 months ago. But I thought when we spoke earlier that the process of notification of new developments, there's a timeline. Was this outside of that process? Ms. Appler, do you have any idea? Working with the county on notification so that we can look at the impact of schools? So uh, we are working to improve uh, that communication of right now where don't we get um, development plats in to when they are proposed we don't know of approvals this was actually discovered in a part of a routine boundary cleanup that we we noticed this and took action um, we are going to work more closely with Baltimore County planning to get a better log of all the approved developments in a timely fashion and then map them immediately to see if there are impacts on boundaries I wanted to emphasize in response to Mr. McMillian's question that we did not know about it for 12 months, which is the time period it takes to, to com complete a full-blown redistricting study. It came to our attention in last few months, whether it is February or January or March, I don't know. So, Mr. Dixit, to keep that from happening on a going forward basis, can we request some type of root cause analysis from the county um, and see why this fell outside of the normal parameters so that we were pushed into even looking at this um, boundary study? We will absolutely do that. It is definitely a very good suggestion. And Ms. Appler and I will have regular meetings with the county folks to get as much information as we can in advance. And then my process question is this, normally when we have a boundary study that we follow the full um, policy 1280, we allow, uh, we have a public hearing and we allow public comment. If we should decide to vote for this shortened period, is there any way that we could tweak the process a little bit to have constituent questions answered. Normally we don't have a two-way dialogue, but there may be a question that comes to us that needs to be answered, um, not just for the constituent, but for board members. Is there a way that we can post answers to the questions that we get? Ms. Apple? Uh Yes. If you provide us the questions, we can look um, similar to what we've done in past boundary processes um, in publishing frequently asked questions and answers to those. Okay, thank you both very much. Madam Chair, this is Daryl Williams. I just want to make a few comments. Um, when the team brought this to my attention, um, we it was in the midst of the pandemic and um, knowing how we back map, back map board meetings. So hearing the discussions, I think we can go back and look at how we can extend the feedback time. And Ms. Appler said we can look at the questions, but we can also looking, look at the timing of this and potentially look um, at some other alternative in the month of June. If, we're, if we won't make the first June meeting, we may have to look at some other alternatives. So keep in mind, the team was simply, the issue came up and they were back mapping how to get this uh, to the next board meeting, where in fact, uh, right now we only had one board meeting scheduled for June. This may mean, plus some other topics may mean well, we may have to schedule a second board meeting in June. Thank you for that, Dr. Williams. And that is helpful for the rest of the board, I think, in consideration of how we want to move forward, that um, it is an option and um, probably a likely option that we will have to have another board meeting in June, given uh, a lot of changes that are happening 
around um, timelines with the operating budget and other issues. As we know, things are changing um, because of COVID. So I think that that's something that we need to consider because I have to say this is very short notice. Um, and in terms of doing a boundary study for continuity of neighborhoods, I know there's a neighborhood that has been trying to get a boundary study for years um, that's fully populated, fully built, and I mean five years or more. So um, it's curious to me that this is an emergency. Um, and also given um, the resolution that we just passed around policy, around policies and consideration of the pandemic, if we have to evaluate a, and do the due diligence around this boundary study, and as Ms. Rowe pointed out, to allow uh, the community to have input and questions asked and then answered, um, if we need to modify the implementation of it, then that's something that the board and Dr. Williams can discuss as well. Are there other board members with questions or comments? Yes, hi, this is Makita Scott. I just wanted to know um, if you could repeat again, how long was the input, the time for community input? Till May 29th, for 10 days. And when did it start? Uh, when the boundary study website went up, which uh, was the 11th. Of May? Correct. So it went from May 11th to May 29th? Yes. Thank you. This is Ms. Fawzi. Ms. Fawzi, this is Ms. Hen. I haven't spoken on this yet. May I? Yes. So I, I hear the concerns that board members have expressed about the abbreviated timeline. And this is actually something I've, I've talked to Dr. Williams about as well. Um, since this community resides in, is in my district. And I, I hear those concerns, but I think what we need to um, be cognizant of is the scope of, sorry, I have a family member who wants to talk as well. Um, I think we have to be cognizant of the fact of the scope of this and the fact that what, it was four houses that have been built, the others haven't been built, it's an opportunity that is going to have to try. And to your question of why it's an emergency, it's an opportunity that we won't have if we wait. And I think of the impact or the, the effect of voting and the impact that that will have on children. And after all, we, are, we need to do what's in the best interests of children. And if that means doing this now and doing no harm, then that in my mind justifies doing it now. And I, I don't see the downside in doing that. And that was the feedback I shared with Dr. Williams. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Other board members that have not yet spoken on this issue? Uh, this is to, uh, this is Ms. Pastor to Ms. Hen. So, uh, oh, well, maybe it's to um, Ms. Hen and uh, Mr. Dixon as well. So, one, the children will definitely not go to Perry Hall. Is that correct, Mr. Dixon, with this plan? That's true. Perry Hall Middle School. They will still go to Perry Hall right. High School. But Perry Hall Middle, I'm sorry. And the other piece, I, I, I do recall somewhere along the line, I can't remember, um, whether it was this year or last year, but I remember a portion, uh, some folks from a portion of a community coming back um, about asking us about changing a boundary just for their uh, little group of houses because it wasn't done when we first um, did the boundary study. So this would absolutely abate, remove uh, obstacles down the road. So you're saying with this study, everything would be laid out now. And so as other houses are built, folks coming in know where they go, there won't be a split community. So no one has to come back about changing because they wanna be a part of the other. Is that correct, Mr. That, Penn or Mr. That, that's absolutely correct. 
All right. Thank you. Other board members want to make comments or suggestions? Yes, I have a question, uh, Lily Rowe. I would like to know uh, when this website went up on May 11, what communication went out to the public in the form of press releases, et cetera, whatever, to inform the public that this was happening and that they had the ability to make comments? Ms. Appler, you're doing, no, you're doing. Um, There's actually a press release that will go out tomorrow um, announcing the comment period and the ability and the, uh, the methods in which, they, which uh, the community can provide feedback. Okay, so in light of that, I, ha I just have a really big problem with the fact that the community hasn't yet been notified. The press release will go out tomorrow. The press may or may not even write about it. And if they do, like, we need to send emails out or something to the affected schools. Ordinarily, when we do a boundary study, letters are sent home to all the affected schools so that they can provide feedback and we get feedback from principals. I don't necessarily have a problem with condensing the process for the situation, but I do have a problem with not obtaining as much feedback as we possibly can in line with the spirit of the way we normally do this in a situation where the public's going to come back to school and they're going to realize all these changes made and they're going to feel like it happened under the radar because it is not the appropriate communications in my mind have not happened yet and un until we have a process for that appropriate communication i can't support any boundary change may i ask another question yes uh, miss pasture all right um, uh, pulling from Ms. Rose's concern, um, will there be anything different since we have such a short turnaround time in, in, in terms of the, the time remaining? Anything different in communicating this to the community so they know that this might be happening? <laughs> Well, one of the challenges we always face is that we generally like to send detailed information after we have an opportunity to share with the board. So tonight we are presenting it to you, and tomorrow it is our hope that it will be posted on our website and a media advisory will be issued. Had we done it before all of this presentation to them, then there would have been a question that we are sharing with the community without sharing with the board. So that's the dilemma we were in. So that's what we have done. Thank you. When it goes on the website traditionally, and particularly because this is an emergency, what else might be done? Because if folks don't know this is in the pipeline, they won't go to the website. How else will we let them know what the time constraints that they could go on the website or whatever, that something is brewing. Ms. Byer, do you want to comment on that? Yes. Um, so, Ms. Pasteur, you know, typically when we do a longer boundary study, um, we're often doing a study with students who are already living in homes. Again, right now, only four of these homes are, are sold. So it is a little bit different in terms of the way we would communicate. Because normally we're communicating to families and schools where they may be involved in um, potentially switching to a different school. And so um, absolutely, we can work together as a team and look at ways to communicate to the four communities um, that would be impacted, which are Seven Oaks, Pine Grove Elementary, Pine Grove Middle, and Perry Hall Middle. Um, and we could look at how we could potentially target those four school communities with communication. It just wouldn't impact um, other than um, what was shared with you by Ms. Appler in terms of the way um, the capacity would be impacted it's not going to impact any current families in terms of having to change schools. Sure, um, right. The only thing that would be impacted at this point would be 
the utilization of the two schools that are recommended, which is Seven Oaks and Pine Grove Middle. But to your point, Ms. Pastor, we could um, try to target communication to those communities just so that they are aware. Thank you for that. Thank you. So before we move on, um, and again, the board is not voting on this item this evening. Dr. Williams, given the concerns raised by board members and the your comments about the possibility of an additional meeting being scheduled in June, um, how would the process be handled of increasing the amount of um, public comment, the time frame of public comment? So again, I think we would have to look at that. I, I just want to reiterate what uh, Mrs. Byers said. Um, usually, we're notifying groups of students that they potentially, or families, that they may have put, um, a new school assignment in the fall. Um, and, and so we've had these discussions as a team, um, but I just think um, if, if it's about the comments and extending that time with the understanding that we may have a second board meeting, I think we can look at that just to make sure we get all the comments and to answer the questions um, that may arise. Um, I think this may be a little confusing because of what we're talking about. We're talking about a small group of kids currently with the potential of growing and trying to have all of this aligned by the start of whenever the start of the school year may begin. Let me let me put that out there as well. Um, so I just want to reiterate that, that if it's about the comments, and we had this to, as a team, we talked about this emergency boundary um, right now during the this time of, of COVID-19, and, and that's why we wanted to bring it to the board. Um, but I think we can look at uh, working with Mr. Dixon, working with Ms. Appler, looking at a plan, making sure we have the communication plan, uh, as Ms. Byers reminded us of the four schools that, that uh, we're discussing, um, just so it's aligned with our usual practice. Okay, thank you. All right, if there's nothing further from other board members, Thank you, Mr. Dixit, Ms. Byers, and Ms. Shapler. Thank, Thank you. you. Our next item on the agenda is item L, board committee updates. And for that, we will um, go around and just give updates. Um, I'll start over with Mr. Kuhn with audit committee. Thank you, Ms. Causey. Good evening, everyone. The audit committee met on May 13th virtually um, for approximately an hour. We uh, discussed the some April committee meeting activity that uh, Ms. Han had brought up in our unfinished business. And under new business, we talked about the uh, fiscal year 20 work plan, the projected spend versus the actual spend. And then we moved on to the F21 proposed Office of Internal Audit work plan. Uh, that is still being finalized and will be shared with the committee again and then with the full board after it is finalized for everyone's review to, uh, to so everyone can provide their support and any input they might have. After that, we moved on to the uh, investigative unit and their statistical update. Then we moved on to a closed uh, administrative function. And that's really all I have to report. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Ms. Pastor with Curriculum Committee and uh, she's also chair of the Legislative and Government Relations Committee. So Ms. Pastor. Okay, thank you. Uh, the Curriculum uh, Committee. The curriculum committee, um, the curriculum committee uh, met, and uh, uh, there was a really uh, extensive discussion, presentation, and discussion 
on the summer uh, learning plan. And we want to thank um, all of the folks who came in to uh, talk about the different layers. Uh, they are still going to work on entertain how we reach out to those children who might not have Wi-Fi, who might be homeless. Um, and all of this is going to be done prior to school officially closing so that the teachers will have an opportunity to work with the children so they will know uh, what to expect and how to handle the um, uh, self-paced in many situations um, programs that the students uh, in which the students will engage. The summer program also includes the regular summer school uh, program. And um, so there, there are two things going on. Ms. Mack asked the question um, or, or, or continued the question about whether uh, students who are not in the regular summer, who might be at home uh, and who need some support can ever have some human contact. And, and that was a question that I also asked. And so I thank her for um, bringing that out. And the answer was yes. Um, we didn't get any information on where that was going, but at least we know that that is something that's in the planning. For, uh, and there are also two um, um, programs that will be going to contract government and legislative, we uh, went over or had a discussion about the handbook uh, that, of course, is on hold because of uh, the pandemic. So as soon as we're able, we will start working on that again. Uh, and again, that's the government handbook that is modeled after the MAVE one. Uh, we also talked about our relationship and it goes to a number of things that were said tonight with the county council. Uh, Mr. Baysmore talked to the, uh, uh, the, the chair of the council and um, uh, uh, council person Bevins, and we are going to, they suggested that we wait until late fall, early winter maybe, when things have died down uh, but the county council is very interested in supporting us in terms of lowering lowering the um, percentage of what overcrowdedness is. Um, they recognize, just as we do, that uh, our constituents are concerned about um, new developments coming in and. Um, further overcrowding some of our schools. So those things are still uh, on our burners. They're just on the back ones right now. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pasture. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Pasture. Uh, the next committee is Building and Contracts with Ms. Henn. Thank you. Um, the Building and Contracts Committee last met on May 5th, um, where we reviewed 29 contracts, which were forwarded to the full board for approval on the same date. And our next meeting is Tuesday, June 9th. That is all for that committee. Thank you. Thank you. And the next um, committee is Policy Review Committee, um, which I am honored to be the chair. We met on May 13th, and we um, had a very um, robust and um, full meeting. Um, some of the issues that we discussed is uh, we did an update on the equity policy work group. Uh, that presentation was done by uh, Dr. Lisa Williams. and. Um, that work is being done in advance of the board reviewing policy 0100, our equity policy. Um, we also established a board of um, a board equity committee. And so we discussed in policy review the establishment of that. Uh, and um, 
I'm happy to report that Makita Scott is going to be the chair of that committee and she'll be working with Dr. Williams, Dr. Daryl Williams and Dr. Lisa Williams, uh, as well as other staff and um, discussing with other board members the establishment of that committee and she'll be bringing um, details of that to the board in our June meeting. We also um, reviewed policy 1270, parent and family engagement, policy 3111, budget planning and preparation, policy 4003, recruitment and selection. Um, and also uh, it was pointed out that in our um, policies scheduled for review at the July 9th, 2019 board meeting, there were 22 policies um, that the superintendent advised that the board would be um, reviewing and following up on during this school year. Um, but then it was pointed out um, by our staff that policy review committee, including our June meeting, will have adopted, reviewed, created, or revised 44 policies. So I'm very, very just pleased and proud of the work on the policy review committee and our staff um, and I just thank everyone for that work. And um, we just look forward to doing more work on behalf of the children. So the next committee, well, the next committee is equity committee. Um, Ms. Scott, did you wanna say a few words about that? Uh, yes, I would, thank you. Um, we don't have a report as of yet because we are just forming and um, we have not yet had our first meeting. However, I look forward to giving updates and reports as to our progress and I look forward to members, um, board members uh, joining the committee and us re really working together to um, uh, help make changes and um, do things for uh, children in BCPS. So thank you. Thank you. And I did wanna say the next Policy Review Committee meeting is scheduled for June 15th. However, uh, we have been adjusting that schedule given the limitations of uh, essential staff being in the buildings and trying to do things uh, for the safety of um, our staff. So if people can go to the website, bcps.org and hit the tab under board leadership and then board committees and our uh, meeting dates are always there, as well as the agendas are published ahead of the meeting. So for any of the public that wants to see exactly when the meetings are and what's being covered, and also they are all um, live streamed. So the next item on the agenda is board member comments and um, I'll just go around the dais and what I'll do is I'll start with Ms. Rowe and then we'll end with, uh, well, you know what, Dr. Hager, would you like to begin? Sorry, I'm here, I had to find it. Um, yes, thank you. Um, this is my first time doing this, so I appreciate uh, the opportunity. I just wanted to sincerely thank my fellow school board members and Dr. Williams and his staff for all their help and their very warm welcome to the school board. Um, I also definitely wanted to acknowledge Mr. Roger Hayden, whose term I'm completing following his passing. I know that he was a dedicated public servant and I certainly have very big shoes to fill. I'm truly honored to serve students and families throughout Baltimore County and I'm excited to officially be a part of the school board and I can't wait to work with everyone. So thank you. Thank you and welcome. And Ms. Rowe, we'll start with you and we'll work our way around. I would just like to welcome Dr. Hager to the board and um, we're happy to have her. And I, I just want to uh, say that the communities that are dealing with this pandemic and in particular, some of the neighborhoods in my district and the neighborhood I live in are really suffering in some cases and having a really hard time uh, keeping food on the table and doing schooling while some of them are still working. And I wanted to just give a shout out to the Student Support Network and to our county executive, uh, Johnny Olszewski, and to all of the people in our school system who are working very hard every single day to make sure that our families in Baltimore County are fed. 
and that basic needs are met. And what I'm seeing even across social media in Baltimore County makes me very proud of our school system and our county because I see everywhere on social media and in next door individual people reaching out that when someone asks for help within an hour there's four or five comments of other people willing to help and that makes me very proud of our school system very proud of our county and very proud of my neighbors and everyone involved and i just want to thank everyone for working together to get through this thank you miss scott Great, thank you. I would also like to echo and um, welcome um, Dr. Aaron Hager to the board. Thank you um, for joining us. I look forward to working with you. And I would just like to say that we are um, we're we're first for a lot of things. And in this time of um, COVID nineteen and what we're going through, I think it's so important that we focus on our children and that we are forward thinking and forward looking on ways that we can help our children to return, help our teachers, help our parents, and really support our community. All the numbers that we're seeing of, of communities um, that are impacted in hot zones, those numbers represent families, they represent people, and ultimately they represent children. And as a system, we are responsible for supporting those children. And I look forward to uh, the formation of the equity committee and ways that we as a board are going to take the helm and, and go forward and um, work to support our community, our children, and encourage learning and, and everything that we can. So thank you very much. Ms. Mack? Thank you. Um, throughout this entire pandemic, there have been a lot of people to thank, but tonight I want to thank parents who have become teachers, teachers who have learned to teach in a new way, guidance counselors who are allaying student fears, school nurses who are reaching out to students to ensure they and their families are well, and most importantly, I want to thank our students who have had so many aspects of their lives upended by this pandemic. We know it's been hard and you have missed so many things but we will get through it. Please, please just hang in there and do your best. Mr. McMillian. Good evening again. I just, I'm concerned about the, the kids and the families that are on the edge, that don't have internet service, that are homeless, that are missing out on the, the virtual learning piece. We, I, I know we're reaching out to those kids and those families, and I just hope that, you know, you know in the next couple of weeks that we touch, we, we connect with them and they understand that they have summer learning opportunities, which I think was a great idea from the curriculum committee when they talked about, you know, letting the people that are online now know that they have the summer, the summer piece that they can get involved with. And secondly, I want to, I support Cindy Sexton 100% uh, in what she wrote to, to us today. I don't want to paraphrase her, uh, but I think anybody that can get a hold of that document she sent to us and read it, I agree with her 100%. Thank you very much. Ms. Jones. Thank you. Um, good evening. I see there's um, only 14 people online, so I'm going to keep it short. I first of all want to congratulate our very own student member of the board for his upcoming graduation, Mr. Omar Rashid, and his acceptance into George Washington University. Congratulations. I also want to welcome our newest appointed at large member, Dr. Hager. Welcome aboard. We look forward to working with you. And I want to take a quick second to thank all of our food and nutrition staff that have been supplying and distributing food to hundreds of thousands of children um, in the past couple of months. I want to thank uh, Mr. Jim Corns and the entire staff who have mailed out more than 30,000 devices to our elementary school children. And I think that needs to sink in more than 30,000 devices in less than two months. That is um, a magnificent job. I know you get a lot of flack in social media, but this was unprecedented and you guys have done a great job. Uh, so thank you, Team BCPS. And lastly, um, 
you know, I try very hard to keep politics out of my life and the school board, but some of you make it very hard. And as a child and as an adult, I have always spoken out when I've seen injustice. Um, I believe in Desmond Tutu's quote where he says, if you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. And I will always speak out when I see injustice, when I see racism, when I see bigotry. Um, so I want everyone to be aware that I'm aware of all of the back channel work that goes on to keep that spinning. And I will always speak out against it. So stay safe and good night, everybody. Ms. Hen. Thank you. Good evening. I'd like to join my fellow board members in first welcoming Dr. Aaron Hager. And Dr. Hager, I'd like to thank you um, for stepping up to serve, um, to serve the children of Baltimore County. Um, this is not an easy job, as you, I'm sure you are aware and will we'll soon discover. And in, in trying to, what I've done is tried to reflect on how I can best help you. And please know that I am here to help you in whatever ways I can. But this is one, one job that it's very much, you learn on the job, but it is a, very much a labor of love. So thank you for stepping up. Thank you for your service and your willingness to serve the children. Um, secondly, I wanna congratulate the class of 2020. You are in my heart. Um, I am so proud of all you have accomplished and your resilience over these last three months. And you may not appreciate it now, but you, I hope that you will look back and realize just how strong you are and what you have endured. And it may not seem like it now, but these will be some of your finest moments. So congratulations. Lastly, I'd like to acknowledge our students, all of our students, our teachers, our parents, and our administrators, and encourage you to find your joy in every single day, no matter how tough that may be sometimes, to find those small moments where you can find peace and happiness, no matter how tough the day may be and what may go wrong in your everyday um, struggles. And I know a lot of folks are struggling right now in our own ways, and we are all fighting our own battles and that's not easy. So please be patient with yourselves, find that joy and hold on to it because we are all in this together and you are not alone. And that's all for tonight. Have a good night, take care. Our student member of the board, Mr. Rashid. Mr. Rashid has left the meeting, Ms. Causey. Thank you. Mr. Offerman? Yes, I want to uh, also pass along my congratulations and thanks for the efforts that staff, central, school-based, parents, students, everyone's made to try and continue, you know, this entire process. I do want to relate one simple story. Uh, I was in touch with a mom who had a kindergarten student, a, young, uh, a little girl, who was thrilled to go to school every day and was crushed when uh, when uh, when school shut down. And she had a real problem, you know, st staying focused and, and staying involved until she got until she got her her device, and and it made it made all the difference for her. So this is just one little story, but I got a feeling this is a story that uh, that has probably uh, happened many 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 times. So uh, th thank you, staff, and. Uh, Let's all sit, let's all stay together, and we're gonna we're, 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 we're gonna we're gonna work through this the absolute best that we can. Thank you, Ms. Pasture. Great story, Mr. Offerman. Uh, Dr. Hager, welcome, welcome. Uh, I look forward to working with you. I think you bring an awful lot to this board. I certainly echo everything everyone has said um, in terms of accolades um, and, and concerns about uh, what's happening with our students. Um, I, I sort of have knocked this down to three words like fear, um, trials, and role changes. And all of that seems to be going on 
We um, see how we're educating our children differently. We have fears about the virus, um, fears about what happens if you go back to work and your children are still home and um, just staying well and, and trying to survive. And for parents, role changes, you've now become teachers and all of the angst that goes with trying to uh, teach your own children and, and, and embracing what teachers go through every day. Um, and I know that we're all doing our best um, to, and we all have our personal things beyond school systems that are impacting us. And I have to say that for me, I, I, I look at those three words, fear trials and role changes, and then I realized that what we are experiencing is life on steroids tenfold because things are always changing. And I, I've kept grounded by thinking, and ironically, it, it has come up this week on my Facebook, um, my mom's picture, which almost killed me when I first turned to the page and saw it there. And I remember in, um, if you will, in 2011, when my mom died and I had been her caretaker pretty much for almost a decade. And I was sure just like so many of us are now that there would never be normal again, that I would never breathe again, like sometimes I feel um, even now um, and I had said I was going to work forever because it filled the gap. And we are looking for opportunities to fill gaps. But two months later, in October of 2011, I made the decision and I announced to my faculty and to the superintendent that at the end of the year, I would retire. And I was filled with so much fear because I had worked since I was 15 and now I was 60 something. But by the time early June came and um, family and friends threw this big retirement party for me at the beginning of June, I had come to the notion and the sense that it would be okay, that I'd be able to survive it all and I would be able to breathe and even without my mother and with all of the changes, not being, not coming to work every day, it would not seeing the children every day, it would be okay. So I say all of that to say that we are going through just life on steroids. Things won't be the same again. Um, but I just congratulate everyone who's made it through this portion because now we're turning a corner to what happens to us in the summer, what happens to us in the fall. Things will never be quite the same, but that doesn't mean that it will be bad. So let's just try to rejoice, do the best we can. I'm so proud of everyone from the staff to parents to the children and the work we continue to do on the board for the system. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kuhn? Well, as usual, Cheryl's uh, challenge to follow, so thank you, Ms. Pasteur, for your, uh, your statements. Um, but I'm going to echo some of the comments we've already heard uh, in uh, bullet point form. First, welcome, uh, Dr. Aaron Hager. We're, we're very happy you're here. Uh, second, I want to congratulate the class of 2020 and Mr. Rashid as a student member for all you've done on the board. We really appreciate that. We want to congratulate all of you on your pending graduations. Next, I wanted to just mention that, um, you know, we still have students doing some, uh, a lot of work out there and I know uh, a number of folks are studying for AP tests that are coming up tomorrow, including my daughter. Um, so I would like to wish them all the best of luck. And I just hope everyone can, uh, you know, finish the year out as um, uh, happy and uh, as healthy as they can. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. 
and I'll keep my comments brief. Um, board members have said so many eloquent and, and appropriate things. I did just want to also welcome Dr. Erin Hager to the board, um, especially in such a difficult time. She's an associate professor at University of Maryland School of Medicine. She was appointed by Governor Larry Hogan after being nominated by the Baltimore County School Board Nominating Commission. And um, we're just really excited to have her here. Um, her work for student um, health and wellness um, is really gonna be helpful. She also has multiple connections to the school system. As a graduate of BCPS, a parent of three students in BCPS, and as an advocate for children's health. And her uh, contributions will enrich our discussions and our decisions. I did want to um, segue to, to something very different. Um, and I'm going to quote from uh, Baltimore County Health Officer, uh, Dr. Gregory William Branch, who said uh, in a statement today, the COVID-19 pandemic is real. It is here and it is lethal. Our children and our most vulnerable residents need all of us to do our part to safeguard them from this unrelenting adversary. And he said that in response to the report of uh, Baltimore County officials of uh, our youngest victim of COVID, a uh, 15 year old teen in Baltimore County. And we know that any one that loses their life is tragic, but it is so especially difficult when a family loses a child. And as all of us involved in education are so connected to children, it is especially sad and our deepest sympathies are with families and community grieving the loss of any of their loved ones. With that being said, we are challenged to continue the work, to do what we can to support students, staff and families in this time. And our uh, superintendent is doing a great job of handling all of these challenges that come up, all of the mandates that come up. Um, and our staff, uh, it's already been pointed out about food and nutrition services, just doing an outstanding job, caring, compassionate, efficient, effective. Um, so we are really just all in this together and we are gonna continue to do the hard work that's necessary. I did also want to spend some time on our graduating class of 2020. It is bittersweet, but we are in the graduation season and we are very proud of you and all that you've accomplished. And if we could, we would reach out and give all of you a hug, but we can't. I uh, was able to see some college virtual graduations and while aspects of those were very different, for instance, seeing a president of a university standing in the stadium alone, there also were very meaningful and impactful and uplifting um, moments in those presentations with their student musical groups, uh, with poetry being uh, recited that was especially created for the graduates. So while our upcoming graduation is going to be different, we are working hard and we know the principals are working hard with their entire school communities to make it meaningful and joyful to celebrate the achievements of their graduates. Um, one of the things that's been great this week is we're seeing throughout County teachers, educators, administrators, principals, families, and communities celebrating our graduates. Um, it, there's songs that have been dedicated to the seniors. There's painted lawns, signs. Um, so please look on our website, bcps.org, because in addition to all of the updates uh, related to our continuity of learning and our responses to the COVID pandemic, there's also a lot of really heartwarming um, examples of how our teachers are are meeting the needs of children, how people are supporting our seniors and really just trying to celebrate them. So just in closing tonight, I would just like to say, uh, to quote Nelson Mandela, that as we move forward, may your choices reflect your hopes and not your fears. Stay safe, stay well, we love you. And then I have the pleasure of the last board um, meeting item, which is item N, information. So we get to uh, point out on the board docs, there are reports. One is the financial report for the months ending March 19th and March, and March 2019 and March 2020. Um, also, there is the uh, report on, the final report on key legislation. 
There's also a report on raising bars and closing gaps, meeting the nutritional needs of students. There was an audit committee presentation on February 18, 2020 by Karen Levenstein, who's the director of food nutrition. And um, that was a very um, comprehensive report. And so I would um, suggest people go and look at that. Also, we have um, item four, revisions to the 2019-2020 calendar, um, pending approval of the Maryland State Board of Education, there would be um, an adjustment to the end of the school year to be June 19th, 2020. So people can go and look at that attachment. Madam Chair, last... if, I, if I may just uh, interject for, for a few seconds. Certainly, uh, Dr. Thank Williams. You, thank you for that announcement. I just want the board to look at the request to the state board um, to have schools and open uh, schools and offices open on June 2nd, which was originally closed for the Maryland presidential primary elections. Now that that's online, um, I think we can uh, make use of that day, which then would, as you just announced, make the last day on June 9th. Do we have a time frame of when we'll hear back from the Maryland State Board? Uh, their next meeting is. I believe May, the, uh, the end of May. I'll get that date, but it's the end of May. So then a press release will go out after that, documenting the any adjustment. Yes. Okay, I thought I lost you, Dr. Williams. Okay, thank you. Is there any other comment you would like to make, Dr. Williams? Again, I will just associate myself with everything that our board members said to the class of 2020. Um, uh, just hang in there uh, to Mr. Kuhn's comment to all those students who are taking AP exams. We wish you well, do your best. Um, we will uh, continue to talk about um, our next steps with closing out the year and providing updates to the community, but to particularly to the class 2020 and those who are making level changes those who are going into high school those who are going into middle schools uh, we also understand and those who are just starting school we, we also understand that we're going to have to do something different in terms of how do we provide an orientation and support to you so um, you can make that adjustment so uh, we thank you for your patience we thank you um, as it was shared that parents have have always been teachers, um, but I'm sure during this time, it, it really has put some stress on a lot of us. But we thank you for all that you do, parents, and definitely our staff, teachers, our paraprofessionals, our support, our administrators. But I just wanted again to say congratulations to the class of 2020. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams. The last item is item O, announcements. The board public comment on the fiscal year 2022 capital budget will be receiving written testimony through, oh, it was accepted from May 12th through tonight. You can still get in um, and go to bcps.org for that. And the last item is that our next board meeting will be Tuesday, June 9th at 6.30 p.m. And that concludes our meeting. Stay safe, stay well. Thank you and good night.